StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. I'm wearing a turtleneck, so you can tell it's Christmas. It's Christmas time approaching, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you guys. This is the last interview we are going to publish this year on startuprate.io only episode you can expect is on the 25th of december our legendary fintech review this year with a new concept of course i'm talking about an interview here and i do have a guest europe's most important seed investor um hey alex how you doing hi how's it going i'm fine yeah it's a real pleasure to have you here and um, we may tell the people a little bit about the background, why I, te- why I tell the people, hey, he's the most important, da, da, da. So um, you are working with high-tech Gründerfonds. Of course, you can tell from the language, this is a German construct. It's, it's a government and private backed fund, a private-public partnership with approximately 1 billion US dollar under management and 600 seed investments, by far the most active seed investor in Germany and Europe. And you actually do not only have funds from 33 large and medium-sized private companies like Robert Bosch, SAP, Bayer, and BASF, but you also do have money from uh, KFW and the Ministry of Economics. That's an interesting construct. Can you tell us a little bit about the history and um, where it originates? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, maybe a little correction uh, uh, up front. We're not the uh, most important uh, seed investor. We, we see ourselves as the most active seed investor as we do 40 new investments per year and have been doing this now for 15 years. And right now we are at number 599. So next week will be the big 600 uh, seed investment. And on top of that, we're very active doing follow-on rounds in our portfolio. So on average, we do almost 200 follow-on rounds uh, in, in, in the active portfolio of about 300 companies. And this year, we will be doing also 20 exits. So in total, we'll do like 250, 260 transactions this year. So almost every day, every working day, one transaction. Very, very busy, very active. Important, I don't know. Uh, we see ourselves as the most active. What's the history? So we need to move back uh, 15 years. In 2005, uh, the, actually the German government uh, the, recognized the importance of innovation. So our competitive edge is not cost, it's, it's quality, it's innovation. And they set up 12 uh, work councils, work groups, um, around different aspects of innovation. And one of them was dealing with the question of innovative startups. And back then the situation was there were no innovative startups being financed in Germany as there was no money uh, after the big burst of the 2000 bubble. No, everybody was afraid of investing in startups. Uh, the VC funds uh, died out themselves. They didn't have uh, any money or they tended to invest much, much later because you know it's too risky to invest in, in seed stage companies. So the proposal out of this expert group came, not surprisingly, to set up a fund. And then everybody within that uh, group was were asked, well, so let's set up the fund. Who is contributing what? And then indeed, the German government said, well, we put down 240 million euro. Plus there were another 15 million from KFW, which is a government-owned bank. And then... Six you know, very large companies put up 17 million, which is not much uh, in in comparison to the whole fund size, uh, and, and and but it was significant because it put us on a very different rail. We were no public funding agency, but rather a independent venture fund with independent management, independent structure, you know, separate office building. Uh, very state of the art IT, uh, variable pay. Uh, we could pick, you know, we could build our team. We could pick the best investment that we could find. So the the private component was very important. And then over time, we we uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, 
de delivered significant value for our public investor, but also for the private investors. And that led in the, uh, to the fact that in the third fund that we closed two years ago, the share of the um, private investors increased to 34%. They contributed 110 million out of the 320 that we've raised in the third fund. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice symbiosis. Uh, the public shareholders are very happy. The, the private shareholders are very happy. And that's our DNA. Um, we are profitable, but our goal is not to maximize the profit, to squeeze out the last euro. Uh, but you know, we want to be successful, of course. So we're profitable, but we also deliver lots of benefit value for you know, the startup scene, uh, for for Germany by building great companies that you know strive and are successful and create jobs and pay taxes. So you are an investor that not only defines its success by just having big exits, but also to contribute to the growth of the German startup scene. We may add that the big boom you are referring to was the dot, the bust of the dot com bubble, which hit especially Frankfurt pretty hard with all the uh, companies of the Neue Markt disappearing. I think that, uh, yeah. yeah no, sure, sure, sure. Disappeared. There's, there's quite a few very successful survivors. So I think a third of them uh, survived and, and became even more valuable that, than they were in 2000. Uh, but but it, it was a bloodbath. The the stock index of the of the of the tech companies in Germany, the Neue Markt, the stock index fell by 95 percent. So everybody was like, oh my god, everything is going down. The world's going to end. And and that's the that's the scenario where we um, where we restarted basically the the tech scene in in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been stalking you a little bit, and of course, everybody who'd like to learn more about you, they can go down here in the show notes where you wherever you're watching this or listening to this, go down there in the show notes. There is a link to our to your personal LinkedIn profile as well. I've been stalking you a little bit on several profiles and they told me not only uh, did you work for Siemens and Deutsche Bank, you also have a PhD and you did an MBA at UT Austin. Do you think that changed a little bit your mindset working in big corporates and doing an MBA in foreign country? Yeah, definitely. It, 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 I was very lucky uh, in, in over the several stations that I had to see very different companies. So before I studied, I worked as an apprentice, um, learning basically retail banking. At, at then, you know, the very, very, um, very big and, and very prestigious Deutsche Bank. Studied business in Mannheim. And with a scholarship, I had the opportunity to study two years in Austin, Texas. And I think that definitely changed uh, my whole life, my mindset, because Austin, um, actually, a, a joke that I was making back then, they sent me over as for a denerdification program. Uh, I used to be a big nerd, <laughs> nerd, and then I was denerdified going to Austin, Texas. And I think that's that that's really what what happened uh, Austin with a big music scene and artist, but also tech, and uh, and and the University of Texas back then it was a business plan competition where we where I very unsuccessfully unsuc participated, uh, and and I was really exposed the first time in my life to something else uh, than what we saw in Germany. I was exposed to tech to to uh, to to the American attitude of trying out of just doing it. And, and being very positive and optimistic about the future. And that, of course, uh, changed, uh, I guess, my personality <laughs> quite a bit. So, yeah, yeah, and it was a great experience. Loved it. Denerdification, the first time I've heard this word here. I um, think the word exist. <laughs> it will exist from now on. And if people ever write a Wikipedia article about that, they have to refer to this interview, right? Um, <laughs> You, you've, but you did not start as a VC investor. From what I've heard, you first um, tried a little bit in innovation at Siemens. Yeah, actually, when I came back from from Austin, 
uh, I, I started to work for Anderson Consulting, uh, today Accenture, doing big IT systems programming and implementation. And that was a very, very good experience because I think it's a very good way to start in tech uh, when, when you later become a VC. I, I programmed uh, not, not, not so shiny uh, COBOL <laughs> on, on a mainframe. Uh, I can still do that. And, and we implemented a huge payment system uh, in, in Germany. And I spent some time uh, doing the project also in Columbus, Ohio and in and, and Frankfurt. And working for an American company, I think, uh, uh, in the early to mid-90s was a great experience because uh, the company was very advanced. There were quarterly performance reviews. Uh, there were criteria. Your performance was being measured uh, with international and also diverse teams. Now, there was a very significant share of women consultants uh, back then on the project, but also within Anderson. And I think it was very unusual. In, in, in at that time, most big German corporates, there were no performance reviews as advanced as, as Anderson had them. So I think the whole performance culture, review culture, but also teamwork and diversity was a very good experience. I quit Anderson, did a PhD for two years back in Mannheim, and it was a very, very interesting topic. Uh, I was a huge Apple fan, and back then Apple was dying. Uh, and I and everybody said it, it's the better product, uh, it's the better system, uh, better quality compared to Microsoft Windows, uh, but it's not successful. So it's it's sort of funny. And I looked at the question: Why was why is one technology uh, becoming the dominant standard as Microsoft Windows did become, and Apple almost died? It, actually, it didn't die just because Microsoft invested in them to to keep them afloat, uh, and not to become a monopolist. And that was a very interesting question. So there's competing technologies, and then all of a sudden there's only one technology dominating everything, becoming the, the, the factor standard. And that was the PhD thesis. And I think it's it's it's, it's it, even still today you see that question popping up all over the place. Will there be a standard, and what do you do to become the standard? And after the PhD, I went to an internal strategy con strategy consulting unit from Siemens, and started in the very late 90s uh, building an, a corporate accelerator. And there I caught the, the venture capital entrepreneur virus. Uh, after, um, after I finished the accelerator, I joined a startup a bit late in the cycle because, <laughs> uh, because uh, very quickly after I joined, 9-11 hit and it was very difficult. Uh, I was doing sales, head of sales. It was difficult selling uh, because we didn't get any more appointments. Uh, but a good experience, very good experience. Um, didn't like it back then, appreciate it very much today. And after the startup failed, I went back to Siemens uh, Corporate Technology, one of the leading, leading uh, tech uh, hotspots in, in the corporate world. Uh, and as a, as a, you know, with a business education, and there were all physicists running around, uh, it was tough to, to, to get the acceptance. And what we did, we, we, identify technologies that Siemens wouldn't need. And then we built startups. We, we took them, you know, wrote a business plan, sourced a team, acquired external financing and spun them out very, very successfully. And, and from there on, I went uh, to HDGF, um, conti continuing that work at a much larger scale. Yeah, that's it. I was a little bit smiling when you talked about all the physicists uh that they had to accept you i wasn't sure i thought maybe your denotification went too far <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think if you're not a physicist whatever you are it's hard to get a, a acceptance on 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 a, on a competence basis on a technical basis <laughs> you have to find other routes and that that's what happened i guess yeah so 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 it was the commercial expertise that i brought to the table And then combining the technical and the commercial expertise, and maybe a little bit technical expertise on my side, um, we successfully spun out uh, technologies where the, the researchers, they really liked them, they really saw huge potential, and no one appreciated with them. We created new companies, and huge. it was new, they hadn't done that before, and it worked well, and they got external recognition the companies became successful so that was quite a thing hmm. sounds pretty good when we talked before because um 
you say you're the most active seed investor in Germany and Europe. For me, that means you're the most important, but you are actually approachable. <laughs> we we had a little joke going before we had this interview and I was asking you, would you reply? Because you, you told me you you read and most likely reply to every email. And I asked you, yeah. would you reply to an email that only states, yo, we should talk? And you said yes. <laughs> yes, I do. So, so of course, there's some newsletter style emails that, that obviously are mass emails that I don't reply to. Uh, but, you know, it, my experience in, in the venture business, it's really the long tail that matters on the performance side. You know, it's a long tail that makes the fun performance. And it's also a long tail in the deal flow where you need to find uh, the, the hidden gems, the, the really interesting projects. And very often, especially in the tech space, It's for, for some founders, it's not so easy to articulate really well. So they don't come across easily uh, or easily to understand. And, and, and we, we made the experience that we saw, you know, funny business plans, funny founders, funny emails. And then when we looked deeper into it, there were, I mean, great companies, great, great potential, great technologies. And with that perspective, I think it's really important to, to, to have a look. And, and, and to reply. And then once you get to know each other, then maybe you come to the conclusion it's not that great. And then, of course, you cannot invest in every company that you see, but, but you need to give everyone really a chance, a fair chance, and, and look at it. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. tough because there's more and more <laughs> different inbox channels. Yeah, of course, there's email, but then there's LinkedIn and Twitter and and telegram and whatsapp and sms so you know <laughs> once you finish one channel then the other the next one is filled up and then it goes around in circles so i think it takes uh, quite some time uh, but i think it's very well invested time ha huh. and there's also slack i'm a member of a lot of slack communities and there's also a lot of messaging going on but fortunately people are not mad at me when i reply like one or two weeks later as long as i do reply i know where you're going at um i've i've seen you that your podcast host yourself and i've seen you appear in a few podcasts your podcast is a very nice combination of german and english it is called Zukunft ready, where Zukunft is future in German. What, what are you looking to do with this podcast? Yeah, I think the title basically says we need to prepare for the future and need to be ready for the future because it, it comes ever quicker, uh, you know, meaning that you know, innovation becomes uh, ever faster, more disruptive, and we need to be even more prepared for for the things that are coming for, for the future. And basically what we try, we try to find really, really good voices uh, of you know, the ecosystem to share their insights. And um, there's so many people who not only are successful, but who have learned a few things that are worth sharing. And that's maybe a little, another, another activity where we give back uh, insights to the ecosystem. And maybe also the big scheme is to encourage founders to 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 do the step to 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 try to set up the companies, especially female founders. The share is way too low, and uh, so we're trying to be positive, encouraging, and uh, appreciating because we believe the potential is uh, is, is there and is very big. There were two statements that I really liked when I listened to the your podcast appearances. One of them was failing by doing nothing and you equalized this or uh, your interview partner equalized this with uh, some German industries. They wait and see. And when they realize, oh, that is working, it's actually too late, like Nokia with a smartphone. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I think the key point is the German engineering culture is to have the perfect product. And, and then in, in the end, maybe it's too perfect, it's over-engineered. And the price that we pay for being perfect is that we're slow. And, and sometimes we are very slow by doing nothing. So we don't try out things. And, and I think the opportunity cost 
uh, and that's what I mean by failing, the opportunity cost is that we don't tap into the potential of the opportunities that are coming along faster and faster. So even when we try something and then fail, it makes us faster. Now, we learn, we get feedback, we get new ideas, we um, iterate and, and try again. And by trying again, we are much closer to, you know, to, to finding all, to, 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 to finding the opportunity. And when we do nothing, then, you know, other people will, will, will grab the opportunity. So I, I think the key to success is to be fast and, of course, smart and then um, eventually hit the right direction. Uh, and, but the worst thing to do is, is of course, nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe one last sentence, because in the in the in the in the in the, in the perfect culture, um, you know, in the perfection perfectionist culture in, in, in the engineering Germany, you know, but the the aspiration to not do any mistakes, you you could do that by being, you know, perfect, or you don't do any mistakes by when you do nothing, and very often, especially in a corporate culture, the 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 goal to not make any mistakes uh, leads to not trying out and and that's the certain path to failure hmm. what what i also did like it actually made me smile because you're admittedly a very big fan of bitcoin and in a uh, switzerland based podcast you talked about the goal of a uh, bitcoin at 500 thousand us dollars per bitcoin what are your thoughts behind that well it's really the time frame uh when will we see 500 000? Uh, some people have have to eat at the end of this year uh, in a few days uh, so some of their body parts because their prediction didn't come true <laughs> you know john mcafee one million um yeah i think it's easy it's there's only 21 million bitcoin ever and a few million have been lost And, uh, and there, and, and then if you look around, there's, uh, trillions and trillions, uh, of, of money, of, uh, of bonds, of stocks, of gold floating around. And, uh, I think the 500,000, um, the Winkle Foss brothers also have said that, you know, if you look at the market cap of gold and you apply that to, to Bitcoin, then it, it would translate into half a million per Bitcoin. And I think in the long term, over 20, 30, 40 years, it will be much, much higher uh, because um, money will inflate. There will be much more money being printed in all monetary systems uh, in, in, in the US, in Europe, in Japan, also China. And you know, the more money is being printed and, and there's a limited um, store value like Bitcoin, you know, the higher the price will be. So, so I think in the very long run, 100 years, it will go to infinity. Hmm. Uh, at the time of recording this, we're standing at uh, just above 18,000 US dollars uh, <laughs> per Bitcoin. Let me get a little bit to actually what you are doing. The High Tech Gründerfonds or HTGF it is called on a, a short. Um, this is a unique construct and it goes back to Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. Um, can you t take us a little bit on the journey? What led there? Yeah, basically, it, it was the situation where um, in 2004 and 2005, only 20 startups in all of Germany, uh, 20 tech startups, uh, got venture funding. And uh, by any comparison, uh, that number is uh, too low. And there's a very long-term statistic that, that uh, calculates the share of vendor venture funding in the German gross national product. And, and that share also is, is, is very low. And traditionally, the German funding finance scene is, is bank-driven. And maybe basically that, that uh, dates back to the end of the Second World War. Everything was destroyed and then no one had any money, but it was the banks that, that first had any money. So they started to to fund industry and and you know companies. So traditionally um, it, it's a, a debt 
funding culture, not so much an equity funding culture. And um, in, in Germany, the, the share of the households who, who hold stocks is, is around 10%, much, much lower than in most countries in the Western world. So in, in, in that, in that, in that, with that background, uh, trending back many, many years, and then the bursting of the internet bubble 2000, no one, really no one uh, wanted to uh, fund any startups with equity. There was no equity. There was very, very few venture funds. Uh, there were very, very few angels. There was no corporate, uh, almost no corporate uh, venture funding. And that, that, and, and, and then there's many, many statistics. Josh Lerner at, at, the, at the Harvard Business School, he showed that venture-funded startups are much more innovative in, in terms of patents. And of course, there's all these success stories in the US, but also in Israel and, and, and the UK and, and, of course, China. And by any comparison, uh, the, 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 the venture funding was uh, too low and the potential at the same time uh, as Germany is a tech-driven uh, economy, society, uh, the, the potential for, for, for successful startups was much, much higher. So, so they came up with a, with a proposal to set up the fund, and that, that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I've been researching a little bit some of the investments you guys are having Sex Wunder Kinder, known for Wunderlist, where you made an exit. Outfittery, User Lane, and Windeln.de should be pretty familiar to all people listening to the podcast. And I actually found three current portfolio companies, namely Bitwala, um, Co module in a very old interview, audio only, and Creolytics, where we did the interview actually in the rooms of the German Accelerator in New York that mm. we interviewed. Um, that is quite an interesting portfolio, and you have much, much more, of course. So, um, everybody out there is wondering how you guys are investing. How do you find your investing investments? Yeah, basically, there's there's three routes. The first route is people come to us. They know us and they send us business plans uh, or get introduced to us. The second route is uh, we go out to you know pitching events, to startup competitions, uh, to incubators, uh, to universities, where we talk to founders uh, who are um, you know in the process of setting up their companies. And then the third route, route, which is a little bit new, we've been doing that now for two years, and we call it active sourcing. So what we do, we, we scrape databases, um, the German business register, but also other databases uh, where, we, where we look for newly funded tech companies. And then we approach them very actively and introduce ourselves and um, basically ask them if they... Uh, if they would be open for investment and if there's anything we could do for them uh, in terms of you know helping the companies become successful and the third route became uh, quite significant uh, especially this year because <laughs> there are no events not so many events where we could go out and meet founders um yeah we go out and try to find them huh I, uh, uh, my mind is sometimes pretty devious and I was wondering if you ever wrote an email to startup founder, yo, we should talk. <laughs> Maybe we did. I didn't. Uh, but but we've been doing this for many, many years. So in, in the end of 2008, we invested in Mr. Specs, uh, online glasses, and um, and definitely one of our best investments. And um, and I heard about the company uh, you know, somewhere in the, in the, in the late summer, And I actively sent an email to Dirk Graber, the CEO of Mr. Specs, and said, well, I think that's an interesting concept. Would you like to talk? And then and he called back and, and we talked. And we convinced him to, you know, to go with us, uh, which was uh, you know, very successful. Yeah, and of course, you know, the, the big challenge, of course, is to, to, to uh, not to, to, to miss anyone. And by having a systematic approach where we scrape databases, that's, that's what we try to do. What do you guys are looking for? What's the metrics? What's the background? Because we apparently have seen some very uh, B2C focused companies like Windeln.de, like other stuff uh, like Mr. Specs. Uh, what are you guys looking for? And is this the focus of your investments? 
So basically, the portfolio is 80% B2B, and then B2C is the smaller part. And I think that that is because in Germany, we're like the B2B guys. So there is, of course, very successful big B2C companies, but that's rather the exception. In uh, where we, when we read the, the, you know, the websites and in the public discussion, people talk more about B2C because it's easier to talk about. It's easier to understand. You, you, you may be customer, you, you, you know, the product, but Germany is really B2B and, and our focus is the seed phase. So very early, um, you know, companies, half of the companies that we invest in when we first meet them, they're not even founded. So it's, it's very, very early. There's, a demonstrator prototype, um, rarely there's first revenue. So that's a very clear, clear focus. That, but in terms of technology, they're very broad. So basically anything, anything with hardware, like IoT, robotics, machinery, sensors, energy, uh, then anything around life science, medtech, biotechnology, chemicals, personal, uh, personal medicine, and then anything around pure software companies like fintech, blockchain, but also uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, IT security, uh, travel and health, you know, basically anything with a tech or innovation um, approach uh, is eligible for us. What is the term of time frame um, any startup would be looking at between, let's say, first approaching you and then in case if you do invest the actual investment? I think our record was 28 days uh, from uh, really signing the, the, the contracts, uh, from the first meeting to signing the contracts. But that's unusual. I think it's not so good because we need to, uh, we all need to get to know each other. And I think it's also important for the founders to feel comfortable uh, with the investor. And I think that takes a little bit of time. Uh, on average, I think you can calculate three months. So we meet and then uh, we meet again and we start due diligence, which basically means we, we try to even better understand what the founders are doing. And then once we're positive in the due diligence, it goes in front of a board and then the board with representatives from our investors including industry, make the decision, and then we, we, we close the contacts. So overall, I think, uh, you know, if you're all working hard, three months is, uh, is it's probably the median uh, time frame, the median. Yeah. Ah, I see, because I've heard about the investment committee before and just want to ask. So apparently it's uh, by people, ULPs, as well as employees of HTGF, right? Yeah, not really. We have a two-step decision process. First, we have what we call team pitch. And that pitch is really important for ourselves where we like um, pull in all the know-how, all the expertise uh, out of the investment team. And if the team is very critical, then, then we would uh, re reject, de decline the investment. But they cannot make a positive decision. The next step then would be the, the official uh, investment board. And I think the investment board, uh, we have a very high acceptance rate there, approval rate. Uh, the invest investment board is made up by representatives from um, our fund investors. So the government didn't send any civil servants or government representatives. They send uh, a VC, an entrepreneur, and a professor. And then there's industry. And pitching in front of industry is really an opportunity to pitch for cooperation for maybe even a corporate investment. Uh, uh, it's the first step to building a relationship to, to our fund investors. It's really much more an opportunity than a, um, a, a formal decision. It is a formal decision, but, but you know, it's, it's even more a, a opportunity to build a very meaningful relation to, to one of our, our industrial investors. When you said um, an entrepreneur, a VC, and a professor, I thought, huh, there's most likely somewhere a joke in that, <laughs> but I cannot find it. Um, no, with no, joke. no, 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 the government, I mean, that's an important point. The government, you know, they have the majority in the front. So they, theoretically, they could dominate everything and they decide nothing uh, in, in, ter in, in terms of investment decisions. Uh, and, and that's really, really important. We can, we have done all our investments decisions based on you know, professional VC criteria. 
not all of them, of course, <laughs> are successful, but there was no political deal, no deal where one one member of parliament said, "Well, this is a company out of my region. Please invest the company in the company." No, not at all, because it's all based on pure VC you know, type criteria. Uh, talking about investment, are you guys also taking lead in a round? We're always taking lead in the round. And that dates back to our history. When we started, there were no other investors, so no one, more or less, except us, could take the lead. And we liked that. We, we very much liked the lead because, especially in the seed stage, lead is fun because you know you can, you, I mean, you can you can change things or you can influence things. You can help the founders. It's a You know, in most cases, it's like two or three guys or girls. And and as an investor, you, you do have some in, impact. You know, once you invest in the D round, and even if you're the lead investor, I think uh, the influence is, is much more limited. And and But as much as we like the lead, the lead role, we hand over the lead role later on. So if there's a large VC or even private equity joining the, the company, then of course, it's not us who has the lead. I see. And in an old interview, I've heard that the entrepreneur has to invest money themselves. That used to be the case. Not anymore. But the third fund that started in 2017, we relaxed that criteria. Uh, so uh, there's no requirement for the entrepreneurs to invest money. Sometimes we politely ask for that uh, because if they have been very successfully Uh, in the past, then maybe uh, they, maybe it helps if they show some commitment. And we've learned it's even more important uh, if if they contribute a little bit, depending on what they can, in in later phases. So if there's a if the company hits a speed bump and uh, they have some issues, uh, you know, three four years down the road, and then the founders say, "Well, I really believe the company is going to be successful." I have a little money, not much, but I put a little money in, in the company. I think that commitment is much stronger than in the seed stage. Hmm. Okay, now assuming you invested, how do you work with your uh, portfolio companies? You introduce them to your LPs, you coach them. What do you actually do for the companies besides just uh, wiring some money? Yeah, so, so the first thing that we do, and I think that's quite important, we try, we really try to understand the company and the founders, because uh, I think the worst thing that um, can happen to a company is not an investor who does nothing, but an investor who helps a lot, but hasn't understood the company <laughs> completely, <laughs> because I think that's um, not so good. So we really try to understand and, and really try to, you know, understand the situation of the founders and really try to understand where they really would need help because they are founders, they are entrepreneurs, they are the CEOs of their companies and, and they need to be in the driver's seat. So it's not us who you know, pushes them aside and says, now we're in the driver's seat, not at all. Uh, but you know, if there's a certain area where we can support them, then, then we offer help. And it, it focuses around a few areas. Um, You know, we've been very experienced in uh, supporting the whole process uh, of securing follow-on funding. Uh, we've raised 2.8 billion euros uh, in follow-on funding for the portfolio. And we know many, many investors. We know their criteria. We can make introductions. Uh, we're very familiar with them as we have made common investments before. So it's much, much easier for our portfolio companies to approach investors that we've co-invested with in the in the past and we also know the criteria so so we know the criteria of the international VCs, of the german VCs, but also the criteria of business angels so what we do we help the companies in the first one or two years to 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 show a performance that they meet the criteria and that can 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 be around sales you know, they need to have minimum sales minimum recurring revenue uh, to be interesting for, for VCs. Uh, it could be that we complement them, um, you know, help the, the founders, you know, complement the team. So in many cases, someone around sales. Sometimes it's, it's really a, a discussion around finding the right focus, finding the right direction, or refocusing or pivoting the company. 
Um, and of course, uh, we open doors in terms of business development. We open doors to our fund investors, but also to many, many other companies that we know. And, you know, with a, for a small startup and a large corporation, sometimes it takes a year or more until they find the right person to talk to. And we can shortcut that process quite a bit. And I also do have seen on your website because you invest in companies, you're very successful, and then you actually did have a lot of very interesting exits, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Especially this year, uh, 2020, has been record exit year. Uh, it's a little strange and, and scary that there's a big crisis and at the same time, uh, um, you know, we had, we had a record exit year. Yeah, we sold nine companies uh, to our fund investors uh, out of the 125 that we sold. And um, uh, uh, and maybe two two of the transactions that we sold to our fund investors, which were, by the way, the, the largest two exits so far that we did. Uh, this year we sold Emma to Haniel, and um, Emma is an e-commerce mattress company. And quite different from uh, many other e-commerce mattress companies, they were very, very capital efficient. Uh, they raised only six million in total uh, from us and business angels, and that's it. Uh, and we sold the company for 200 uh, to, to Hanya, uh, giving us a very, very nice multiple. And what's, what's really worth n noting about Emma, that they only needed uh, six million to, to achieve more than 200 million revenue and be profitable. And, and so very capital efficient, which we like because we didn't get diluted so much. And um, and, and the other one last year that, that's worth noting, um, it actually was a Swiss company that, that uh, we found in Geneva, Amal Therapeutics. Uh, and what, basically what they do, they uh, de develop a, a solution to activate the immune system to find certain types of, to, to fight certain types of cancer. And we sold that company for close to half a billion euros to Berlinger Ingelheim, also one of our fund investors. So uh, it's e-commerce, not so high tech, and then it's can cancer therapy, high, high, high tech. <laughs> so you guys can invest all over Europe or are you just uh, focusing on Germany? We're focusing on Germany, but we can invest actually all over the world. So we've done a few investments in the US But it's not a typical US startup. It's basically uh, a, a German US startup where there's significant operation in Germany and then an incorporation in, like, in Delaware or, or somewhere else. But uh, in principle, uh, we can do we can invest all over the place. You need to be close to the investment. So typically, a regional proximity makes sense in the seed stage. Uh, when we talked before and when I did my research even some of your former portfolio companies are now investing in USLPs, right? No, 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 no not yet. We have one uh, LP of a company, Fond Off in Cologne. There was a company that we had in the deal flow in 2010. And back then, our criteria was the company need, needed to be younger than one year, and they were like one and a half years. So we couldn't invest in them because they were too old being one and a half years old and they got a business angel investment basically and that's all they got and then uh, it became very successful and then they turned around 2018 and said well i really like what you guys are doing and they <laughs> invested in the fund but you're totally right um that's one of our goals to have one of our portfolio companies investing in the fund so the, the race is still open <laughs> talking about funds um we now have one two and three is there another fund on the horizon yeah, there's many more funds on the horizon uh, <laughs> no uh, seriously um there is number four on the horizon we plan to close number four in june 2022 so a little bit less than two years away we'll start fundraising next year and we hope that the corona A situation situation is much better uh, and the economy much better then. But also, what's also on the, on the horizon is, uh, uh, you know, by, by the German government, some sort of later stage growth fund, because that's still um, a, a significant gap in the funding ecosystem in Germany. You know, large funding rounds are, of course, hard to acquire, but then 
there's very, very few German investors who can buy tickets larger than 10 million. So uh, it might be that we can address that uh, next year. Hmm, that's already a very good interview and we're talking for more than 45 minutes. So there's just some final note. How can people reach you and learn more about the process? Yeah, I mean, learn more about the process. Uh, I think we have a, a very good website. You can look at the website. I think that it's self-explanatory. I, I do recommend to talk to other founders that we've invested in because it's not just the process, but it's also anything around that. Are other people really as nice as I say it <laughs> and competent? And of course, you can talk to us, and and you know, and, and you can just use any channel that you find. You can call. You can use any other communication channel, uh, email and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, and and we do we do make quite some PR, so you can learn about us, what other people say about us. Uh, you know, other startups in the press or, or the press. Um, yeah, but we're very approachable. Use any channel, talk to anyone. Uh, we'll, we'll answer. And um, we'll have down here in the show notes, of course, your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter account, and the website where people can learn more. Thank you very much. It was just a pleasure having you here. Thank you for making the time um, on a Friday afternoon. I know you have a stressful week, but you keep working at it. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. It was just a pleasure having you here and hopefully to hear from you soon again. Yeah, thank you, Jorn. It was a great interview. Thank you for your time. And uh, well, if there's any questions, just approach us. Thank you, Jorn. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.